Hello, and welcome to Hack Your Career. I'm Keith Wilson, Director of Cybersecurity Education for Attack IQ. In this live stream, we're trying to introduce you to all sorts of careers in cybersecurity by sharing the stories of people behind those careers. Today's guest is here not only to tell you about her cybersecurity career, but she also has a message on navigating yours. Please welcome author, teacher, and advisory CISO, Helen Patton. Thanks for having me, Kate. Helen, welcome, welcome. Uh, and this isn't the first time that you and I have got to talk. We actually, uh, we put out a great guest lecture by you uh, just a couple of weeks ago, and it's all around uh, navigating the cybersecurity career path, it goes by the same title as your book. And I think you're a really interesting guest in the fact that not only do you have a great career in cybersecurity, like lots and lots of experience and, and lots lots to offer, and you also wrote wrote the book on navigating your career in cybersecurity. Why did you think that book needed to be written? <laughs> That's a really good question. Well, first of all, I needed it to be written because I was, as my career progressed, I was mentoring more and more people um, that they were people who were students at university who were looking to get into their first cybersecurity job. They were mid-career people looking to do better at the role they were currently in. And it was new leaders who were starting to introduce uh, new security programs into their organisations. And, and frankly, I just didn't have enough time in the day, number one. So I needed to sort of mentor at scale and taking those questions that were commonly asked and putting them into a book was my way of of doing that. I also blog about it, of course, but um, I really felt that, you know, people are asking the same questions over and over and over again. And I wanted to give a ready resource for people to be able to get the questions answered without having to buy me coffee first. That that was really the motivation behind it. Oh, I get that. Yeah. I mean, it's it's definitely, you know, like you said, it's mentoring at, at scale. So what what were some of those questions that kept getting repeated? What, what were some of the more common questions you kept getting asked? Yeah. So for people trying to get into cyber for the first time, they were either coming up through a tr what I would call a traditional educational path. So a college student doing a cybersecurity degree, bachelor's degree, that kind of thing. And so they were like, you know what, we're hearing that all these jobs are out there, but we're, I'm, and I'm applying for them, but I'm still having trouble getting a job. It feels like false advertising that all the jobs are out there. So part of what I wrote about was how do you, as a, as a junior person with no experience, how do you make yourself stand out from writing a, an interview, for, sorry, from writing a resume, from doing an interview, you know, how, what does that look like? But also I'd have people who were mid-career wanting to get into cybersecurity for the first time and not wanting to have to go into a, a lower paid entry level job. So this question of how do you move laterally into cybersecurity was another question that I got lots and lots of, of, of the time. Another when you, example. When you talk be, about moving laterally into cybersecurity, are you yeah. talking mostly like IT folks that were looking to move into cybersecurity or people completely different career paths? Completely different. It, it could be um, someone with a legal degree who wanted to get more into technology compliance, that kind of thing, or a business analyst. Um, I spoke to, you know, people who were teachers at the elementary school or the high school level who, not teachers of, of computer science, but just English teachers or music teachers or whatever. People just want People are, are attracted to the profession. They just don't know how to navigate getting into that profession. Um, sure. and, and so, yeah, that was a really common question. Yeah, I could imagine when you're, when you're, you know, when you've gotten mid-career in one place and go, you know what, cybersecurity looks really cool. How do I connect those dots from That's right. what I'm doing now to moving over? So, yeah. so your book would help somebody like that then? Yeah, for sure. So we talk about the traditional career path and the non-traditional career path. If you're as old as me, you know, lots of people who've taken a non-traditional path. Um, I'm actually not sure if there is yet a traditional path, but but let, yeah, it, it is different than if you're, you know, in your mid thirties or your mid forties or your mid fifties or older sure. wanting to get into cyber than if you're just coming out of high school, the, the opportunity of how to get there is different. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So your, your book helps if I had to sum it up from what I just heard, then it helps those, you know, kind of coming out of college 
uh, trying to get into cybersecurity mm -hmm. or those of you making a, a career change that they don't yeah. work in cybersecurity, but they're looking to move over. Um, what about those that have been in cybersecurity for, say, three to five years, five, six years, something like that, you know, kind of midterm cybersecurity. Maybe they're looking to escalate, move to the next yeah. level. Is there any advice like that in there? Sure, there is. So one of the topics I talk about is making a decision about whether you want to be a manager of people, which is a different skill set than a technical SME who's going to For go sure. deep in the technical space. So um, actually all the way through the book, I start with you've got to know why you want to be doing security. If you're in security, you want to know, you've got to be able to articulate why you want to stay. And that's is, why... Is just is just for the money a good reason? It can be an absolutely good reason, but it, but that answer is going to determine where you go next, right? Sure. So there's a lot of money to be made in ethical hacking, less so, and this is a general statement, but less so in things like governance, risk and compliance or training and awareness, right? Mm -hmm. So if you're chasing money, it's a different, it's, a, it's gonna take you down a different path than if you're there to, um, as sort of a service model of protecting the community from bad things happening. That's just that, that, you know, do you go into work for a startup or do you go and work for the government? You know, those kinds of questions need to be answered before you decide where you're going to apply for your job. And the, the answer you give is going to determine where you apply for a job, right? So, yeah, the, this sort of understanding your per, your personal purpose and how that translates to finding work is really an important question to ask. Awesome. So I also want to put out there for those uh, watching the stream, if you do have any questions for myself or Helen, please put them in chat and we'll see if we can get them addressed during the stream. Um, so how how is writing the book, how has that impacted your security career at all or has it? It has actually. So, um, so I started by blogging and the book was really an output of two or three years worth of blogging that I did. So with the blog, I was starting to get more of a public profile anyway. Um, but having a book, it's sort of funny. The, um, I didn't write the book actually because I thought people would read it. I wrote the book because I wanted to write a book and and I thought it'd be nice if people read it. But it's really opened up some doors for me in terms of people recognizing who I am, people wanting me to come and talk uh, with their either their individual security teams or more broadly in a public forum. So it, it's definitely helped my professional profile to have a book. Um, but more importantly, people want to engage with me on these, the, on the topics that were in the book. So it's helped me for my myself, and it's helped me be a better mentor for other people because I've had this input from the community on what they agreed with or what they didn't agree with on the book. And sure. to be honest, if I was writing the book now, I'd probably write differently than than eighteen months ago when I was actually putting pen to paper, so to speak. Well, yeah, you've had time to collect more data points. Yeah, absolutely. So there might well, be a second edition. Who knows? We'll I was going to say there, there's always a chance for a second edition or you know some other revision for it. Yeah. So, or maybe a whole new book. Uh, maybe. Uh, yeah. I haven't worked that one. I'd like to write another book. I don't know what on yet. So we'll see. <laughs> yeah. I, now I, I would imagine those that are watching this, that are maybe trying to get into cybersecurity or listening to this going, well, there's no way I'm writing a book about cybersecurity. I, I don't know that you would necessarily advocate that as your, your way into cybersecurity, but um, maybe a goal you set for yourself after you spent a couple of years uh, doing yep. the work, right? Yeah, I, I actually would encourage people to get their thinking out in public, um, whether that's through a book or a blog or a podcast or a TikTok video, whatever the situation is. My journey started in the early 90s. And for many people, that's not where their journey is going to start. And so my experience, while valid for me, is not going to be relevant for someone who's trying to get into the industry right now. But their voice of what they're experiencing, trying to get a job interview, trying to navigate their first role, trying to grow through an organization is super relevant to other people. And we need more voices in the space. Yeah. So I I would say, you know, don't feel like you've got to have 
the answer to everything or you've got to be expert at everything before you make your thoughts known i think that i think the more people we have talking about these topics the better it is for everybody yeah and i mean that that's a great point too is you can still be new and have thoughts and opinions on how things work you can still come in with knowledge that's um, right. and, and you should constantly be questioning things anyway whether you're new whether you've been doing it for a while Right. So I think that's a that's a great practice, right, of of continuously trying to evolve. Mm -hmm. um, now, you're currently an advisory CISO to Cisco and Digital Directors Network. Mm -hmm. Tell me a little bit more about this. What, what do you do as an advisory CISO? Yeah. So I will tell you, my, my role at Cisco is my day job. My Digital Directors Network is additional to that. Um, different kinds of roles going on there. As an advisory CISO at Cisco, um, first of all, everyone who, with the title of advisory CISO has been a CISO in the past. So we bring our own personal experience mm -hmm. and we do a lot of um, communication both with the community at large around strategic topics, as well as internally within the company in terms of, you know, what does that mean for our products and our services and our strategic roadmap and things like that. So it's sort of a bi-directional, both internal and external role most of it's external um, and it's an interesting role because I get to be in rooms with other security leaders or policy makers or uh, engineers and we get to to sort of think through what are the issues of the day but what are the issues that are coming down the pipe that we're going to have to be prepared for mm -hmm. and you know think about creative ways um, to, to try and address those issues. The reality in security is that the issues we're facing today may have different faces and different names, but they're often the same issues we've been dealing with for 10, 15, 20, 30 years. Um, and, well, and give so, me an example. You know, we still deal with issues of um, the, the advanced persistent threat actor is mm -hmm. going to be addressing vulnerabilities in our environment that have probably been there for a long time and the fact that they're not patched is what's exploited sure. and that's not a new thing that's been going right. on since the 90s too right uh, being able to socially engineer a fish to compromise a user either for a ransomware event or a business email compromise that's been going on since the early 90s too. So well, that's that's been going on for hundreds of years before there was electronics. <laughs> yes, that was just, yes. you know, being a con artist, right? That, yeah, absolutely, right. It just now has a technology technological tool in front of it. That's the only difference. Right. So, you know, from a security perspective, we're all running around going, this is a new industry and a new thing, but the issues are actually pretty old. So mm -hmm. how do we think about that? How do we move the industry forward? You know, is, is part of my job and I, it's really exciting to me to be part of it. So what what was it that made you want to be an advisory CISO? I mean, did somebody approach you and just say, hey, we've got this opportunity, we think you'd be a good fit, or was it something that you sought out? Uh, yes. <laughs> uh, so I was a chief information security officer at The Ohio State University for about eight years before I moved into this advisory role. And eight years is a long time to be an operational CISO. Uh, and I felt like I had achieved what I wanted to achieve in that role. And I wasn't really looking for another operational CISO role to immediately roll into. And at that time, I was also approached to take on this role at Cisco. And it seemed like a good next step for mm -hmm. me. Um, I wanted to expand my knowledge. I wanted to, ex beyond what I already knew in the sort of Ohio State bubble, um, I wanted to... Uh, get to to see what was happening on the vendor side of the house, which I had never worked in before. So it was a, a new experience for me to take, but one that leveraged the experience that I brought with me. So there was a number of reasons why I took it, but but it, it was a sort of a matter of being ready and having an opportunity land in my lap, which seems to be my career path. Very rarely did I choose to go, to go from one role to another. And even where I did, um, pretty quickly there was an organizational change in the organization that changed the role that I thought I was walking into anyway. Cisco was no exception um, to that rule. So 
uh, you know, one of the things I talk about in my book is you've got to be ready to to change because something changes in this industry right. all the time. Um, yeah, n nothing like having change thrust upon you. Like, it's, it, <laughs> you're, right. you're absolutely correct. It happens all the time. All the time, yeah. So, so that was no different. So, you know, it was a, it was an opportunity that I was ready for that I didn't plan for is what happened. Okay. Yeah. Now, what what sort of what sort of challenges has this role presented for you that are in, we can even, let's compare it to the traditional CISO role yeah. that you had. What, what are some of the challenges? Cause you spent, you know, like you said, seven, eight years at Ohio yeah. state as the CISO there. And now yeah. I'd yeah. imagine there's quite a bit of difference. Yeah. I, um, the, the things that were different about this role surprised me a little bit though. Right. Um, so if you've been in the industry as long as I have, there's a, there's sort of a sense that you're not going to come across it, that many new things that you hadn't seen before. Um, that's not true uh, in, in this role. I think one of the challenges of this role is I get to talk to a lot of really smart people, whether they're internal to the company or in the security industry at large. Um, and there's so much information out there about trends, about activities, and you can't know all of it. But when you're in an advisory CISO role, they do expect you to have an opinion about most of it. Mm -hmm. um, and so being able to be clear on this is an educated opinion <laughs> that, that when, when I'm talking about it, I actually sort of do know what I'm talking about versus this is a semi-educated opinion in that I might know the terms, I might have read about it, but I never lived it. Sure. Uh, is is something worth thinking about. And, and when you're reading information about cybersecurity online, however you get your information, it's one of the questions you have to ask. Is this, a, is this person a talking head because they know the language to use or have they actually walked in the shoes, in, in the topic deeply is a really important fact check to go behind. So being relevant to a broad audience of people globally is is actually a really big job. So that was a challenge for this job. I think more personally, things like I'm now in a single contributor role again, whereas I used to have a team of people reporting into me mm -hmm. and I miss having a team of people reporting into me. Um, I have a little bit of survivor guilt, like when solar winds happened or log4j, I didn't have to stay up at night trying to respond to that because that's not the advisory CISO role. Right. but I wanted to be, right? So so I sort of miss the adrenaline rush of doing incident response that I had in my old role that I don't have in this role. So every role you take has a has a pros and cons, oh, right? On the sure. one hand, I'm not staying up late worrying about something. On the other hand, I feel like I still should be. So, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I get that. Um, it's funny whenever, you know, I have, I have a, a you know, maybe a, a day that's a bit more quiet in my calendar. It's always like, all right, what's going on here? What, what's about to happen? You know, yes. I, I still kind of have that, um, you know, before I did the educational piece for, um, for Attack IQ, I worked as a sales engineer. So I right. worked on the sales side and we were all, I always felt like we were putting out fires or just responding mm -hmm. rapidly to things. Absolutely. So now it's kind of like, you know, not necessarily fires, but at the same time, I'm still waiting for them. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. That's right. Mm -hmm. Now you're you're also an instructor at Ohio State University. Yeah. Now yeah. you were the CISO before that, and yeah. I think that's that's a really interesting outlook to have, and that we can share with other people. And the fact that you've worked directly with students, and you were also the CISO of the place that taught those students. <laughs> yeah. So what, what's some of the best advice that you, you have for students? Let's say I'm, I'm my junior, senior year. Yeah. Uh, are internships worth it? Absolutely. So there's still a bias in the industry towards having practical experience in addition to formal education. There is still a, there is still a perception in the industry that, cybersecurity changes so quickly that it's really hard for formal curriculum to keep up with the changes in technology and the changes in the way we do security. So the, the optimal outcome for a student who's going through college or a community college or even coming out of high school 
is, yeah, go ahead and, and do the coursework. If you can, get a certification, an entry-level cert, but also getting those, those internships, if you can do it, really important. I would also say stay away from, from internships that are not paid. Like th there is no reason not to be paid for your internship. So it doesn't have to be I have to get an unpaid internship or I get enough money to live over the summer. Like mm -hmm. it, you can get well-paid internships if you know where to look. Um, so the other the other piece I would of advice is start really networking. And that can be networking in person with student clubs at your university or your community college or whatever. But it can also just be online, like going to local meetups if you're in an if you're in a location that has local meetups, do it. Um, joining organizations like ISSA or ISC Squared that have a, a really vibrant learning community can be really important and a, and a way to get those internships. Um, the, but yeah, if you can get practical experience, absolutely worth it. It will put you ahead of the, the rest of the applicants who are looking for a role that haven't had that practical experience yet. Okay. Hmm. Now, now let's move on my senior year, right? I'm getting ready to graduate. Maybe I've had, I got, you know, an internship uh, throughout uh, throughout, maybe I started out of high school and I was able yep. to get internships, right? Even better, build that right. practical experience. Um, let's say I'm graduating now. Mm -hmm. What What do you tell me? Is it Is it good luck? You know, <laughs> good luck out there, or do you Do you have specific things of All right, now go search these job boards, or is it networking, or is it What it, I know there's no magic bullet, but yeah, what, what should students be doing? So yes, all of the above, right? So so I'm going to say networking, whether you're just starting out, whether you're mid-career, whether you're senior, is such an important part of being in the security profession. So build that build that network early. So networking is really important. In the beginning, so again, the, the, what people hear is that there are so many cybersecurity jobs that are available. And that's true at the macro level, but a lot of the need isn't entry level jobs actually a lot of the need is five to ten years into a career kind of cybersecurity role those are the jobs that are hard to find mm -hmm. as a hiring manager if i put out an, a job rec that says here's a cybersecurity job and it doesn't require any experience you're going to get inundated with candidates so again having that internship is going to be something that differentiates you um, but also having a personal connection to an organization, if not the hiring manager is gonna be super useful. Mm -hmm. And I would also recommend, even if your degree is in cybersecurity and, and the vast majority of students don't have a cybersecurity degree, by the way, they've got something else and that's great. Um, but your next step, your first step, your first job may not be specifically a cybersecurity job. It might be an IT job Yep. with an eye to then becoming moving into cybersecurity after a, a year or two. So so I would encourage college students not just to think about how do I immediately get into cyber, but what would be a sort of a roundabout path to get me into cyber that's going to get me through those first couple of years that gives me experience in IT or policy or compliance or teaching or whatever and then let me move to cybersecurity after that. A lot of cyber hiring managers would say there is no such thing as an entry-level cybersecurity job, that you've got to have some organisational maturity before you're going to be ready to be able to do cyber well. And that's something to think about as well. Sure. Well, I mean, I, I think that all depends on the organisation, how the organisation is set up, right? That's right. If, if the organisation is set up and has a plan to accept um, people who are newer to the industry, but be able to train them, yep. right? They may be able to pay less, yep. but with the promise of like, well, we're going to educate you and, and bring you up. Yes. Or they need to be prepared to pay more to get those more, the the people that have gone through those types of programs yes. the, that are more, you know, that have become seasoned because of that. Right. So there tends, and, and so again, it goes back to what's your motivation for doing cyber and what kind of organization do you want to work in, right? It tends to be bigger organizations that have the, the size of cybersecurity organization that they can have an entry-level job, 
an entry level role available. So you're going to be looking at bigger organizations, maybe, maybe for your first job, or you're going to go to a smaller organization, but know that you're not going to have lots of mentors around you. You're going to be the person learning on the job and that's okay. But also they probably won't pay you as much. So again, what's your motivation for cyber? And if it's money, that's going to have an impact on this too. If it's experience, sure. you can get experience in lots of places, but it may not be specifically a cybersecurity job that you're going to go for in order to get that experience first. Yeah. And I, I, I like the way that you, you, you set that up too is because that kind of broad, broadens your, your options of mm -hmm. yeah, at least getting in and getting some experience started and getting the money coming in. Right. Yeah. Because yeah. whether money's your top priority or not, it's still important. People don't yep. work for free, right? Yep. And so you want that money coming in so you can sustain yourself. Thank you. And that's that's almost the route that I, I I was doing home computer repair was like the first thing I did. And I was doing that while I was still in college. That's right. And then I did the help desk. You know, I help desk help is desk. a great stepping stone for, for getting into security because security you, you, there isn't really a security job where there are few security jobs where you're focusing on one kind of technology or one business process. Right. Usually a really good security person has a really broad understanding of how the organization works. And there is no better place to get that than on the help desk. On the help desk. You're, you're so gonna, the help desk can be a really great stepping stone into cyber. Yeah, well, and help desk, you're gonna find out about things that break in your network that you didn't know were possible because just that's what end users can do. Like you, you just get surprised and you go, oh, mm -hmm. I didn't know that was a thing. And you go learn more about it and you go, oh yeah. So that's how that happens. Um, another, another step that I took that I also recommend to people, cause I don't see enough people do it as a pivot into security is working in uh, support for vendors. So, you know, like attack IQ opens up a support position or my first was with uh, internet security systems. I worked in their support department, right? So that got me, uh, in kind of that was my pivot from it sort of stuff into security was that point and uh, that that really helped me and I've, I've seen other people take that path as well where they come in with a vendor into security because it introduces you to multiple types of right I'm, I'm now talking to different types of enterprises with different types of security problems that either i know and i can help them with or i don't know and i gotta look up and i'll get get help All right. So Helen, um, I know we were, we were breaking up there. Are you, you able to hear me now? Yeah, you're coming back now. Sorry about that. Okay. Okay, great. Well, we're, we're just about wrapping up anyway. So Helen, thank you so much for being on. Um, for those of you are listening, Helen has a book called Navigating the Cybersecurity Career Path, uh, available pretty much everywhere books are sold, correct? Yeah. Yep, so we'll, we're gonna go ahead and <laughs> we'll go ahead and put up the the link in the chat for you as well. Um, so a couple things. So if you want a chance to win that book, keep an eye on our social media channel. We're going to be giving out a free copy uh, at some point later today or later this week. Uh, so keep an eye on Attack IQ social media for more information on how to win a copy of Helen's book. Um, also coming up, we've got Academy Live in New York City that's coming up July fourteenth sign up for that you can go to attack iq academy live we'll also put a link to that in chat and then of course uh, as always we provide you with free training uh, available at academy.attackiq.com so if you're not a member there go ahead and go register for free today uh, we're up to about 22 24 different on-demand classes in our library and we're constantly putting out more so please go academy.attackiq.com for more on free training again helen thank you so much for being on appreciate you uh being here danielle why don't you take us out we'll see you guys next week